Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 292. You're not going to master the rest of your life in one day. Just relax. Master the day. Then just keep doing that every day. Anonymous. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Black Box. Black Box is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content, and you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Black Box, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Black Box takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. And today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. If you want access to filmmaking documentaries, feature films about filmmaking, interviews with some of the top screenwriters and filmmakers in Hollywood, as well as educational online courses all in one place, IFH TV is for you. Just head over to IndieFilmHustle.tv. Now, guys, if you have not checked out the $30,000 filmmaking contest that me and Filmmaker are putting on, please head over to Filmmaker.com. And check it out. It is an amazing opportunity. It's only going on until February 4th. So check it out. Now today on the show, we have film director, writer, and actor, Mark Polish. Now Mark and his brother uh, are famous for making a lot of amazing indie films. Like North Fork and Jackpot, which was the very first digital feature film ever shot. He actually beat George Lucas uh, by a couple of uh, a couple of months. Twin Falls, Idaho, one of my favorite films uh, ever for lovers only, and uh, and then they also got to do some studio work as well, like the Astronaut Farmer with uh, Billy Bob Thornton. And Mark has done some amazing work uh, as an actor, as a writer, and now as a director with his new film Headlock uh, with Andy Garcia. And I wanted to have him on the show to talk about his, you know, journey as an independent filmmaker from the early days of Sundance uh, to working with the studio system to doing, I think, one of the first, if not the first, 5D movie, uh, which was for lovers only, and and all his adventures, and also his book that he wrote uh, with his brother called The Declaration of Independent Filmmaking, which I promise you, if you are an independent filmmaker, you need to read this book. It's one of my top 10 filmmaking books of all time. So let's get into it. Without any further ado, please enjoy my inspirational conversation with Mark Polish. I'd like to welcome to the show Mark Polish, brother. Thank you so, so much for taking the time out to come on the show. Hey, thank you so much for having us. Uh, Having me, there's no us here. <laughs> I was about to <laughs> no, say. You know I was going to say us because my dog is right behind me. Fair so. enough. Yeah, fair I, fair yeah. enough, man. Yeah. I've been a huge fan of uh, of your work um, for years, and uh, specifically a few movies we're going to talk about later in the interview. But before uh, for, before we even get into it, can you please tell the audience how you even got into the business and and, and who you are in general? Because a lot of people might not know your work. Uh, well, I was we first probably known as the, the label as the Polish brothers. Mm-hmm. That was probably the first that people uh, got recognized of who I was mm-hmm. um, more as a, a duo as um, we did a film, uh, our first film, we did a short film that kind of put us on the map. It was uh, a, a Latino based film about boxing called Baja de Pedro. Mm-hmm. And it started gaining some back then festivals were very much more of a, cultivating of talent um i mean you could re- there was no other ways of seeing these movies there was no distribution back mm-hmm. then so a short film could really get you on the map or get you i, I think it does as well today but back then it was if you got into a festival that was your distribution you went from festival to festival 
And this short film that uh, Michael and I made uh, started get, garnering some attention, got some awards, put us in some nice places, some nice rooms to uh, start talking about some features that we had. And uh, originally, we'd had North Fork written and, and ready to go. It just looked too ambitious on paper. Uh, this kind of bigger location thing, Sean Montana, w- didn't look like it was going to work for two young filmmakers who had no credits or you know anything <laughs> underneath. It's just a small 17-minute short film. And so uh, John Grice, the actor, I think everybody pretty much knows him as Uncle Rico on um, and Napoleon totally. Dynamite. Yeah, happened to be our neighbor, um, and introduced us to uh, Rena Ronson, who was at Wayne Morris. Oh, prior to that, she was at a foreign company called Lakeshore. Mm-hmm. She had us in, and we we had uh, talked. She'd read North Fork, loved it, but thought that uh, it was again too ambitious, and we had something else. And I said, well, "We're currently working on this movie, uh, uh, the script about Siamese twins," and that really intrigued her. And she's like, "If you get that done." I think I could get that financed and made. And so that was our first kind of foray into the whole idea of getting something financed. It was independent. It was around $500,000. We did it for 17 days. We got into the, you know, the Super Bowl of Sundance kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Got a lot of attention. Um, came and, you out. Got, and you got into Sundance when Sundance was still like Sundance. Yeah, when it was, when it really cultivated uh, independent voices. And you know, there were so many unique voices up on that mountain at that time. I think it was 99 and uh, i just remember how many great films of that year we had like american beauty you had being john malkovich you mm-hmm. had uh, boys don't cry i mean you name blair witch mm-hmm. you had us you had a lot of films that very unique voices that were coming out at the time and it was a nice class to be around and you traveled with those filmmakers and you became friends with a lot of them so it was a we got a lot of attention off of sundance came off the mountain got a lot of more recognition uh got into uh, the studio system and, and they were very, you know, there was a uh, one in particular uh, by Jeff Robinoff who was running, he was a junior exec at the time, really responded to Michael and I, and we set up a, a deal over there to, to do some, to do some work over there. And uh, that's how it kind of really started from there. And we always kept doing smaller movies while we were kind of cultivating these bigger ones that take, took a while to get made. So we were always kind of try to do these smaller ones. That, so. that's awesome yeah. and and specifically like you were saying that you guys were known as the polish brothers well yeah. you literally played siamese twins yeah, yeah, yeah. you couldn't get any closer than that you, know? I mean, you literally yeah. twin falls yeah. i know you have uh, to be resourceful yeah, you know, no, you, look yeah. and that's that was the way you know you guys obviously are extremely talented filmmakers but that was a, a way to brand yourselves honestly yeah. uh, and, i mean it was it was one of those things that because we were, we had written North Fork and it only had a small role, a supporting role by me. You started going, okay, no one's going to make this for this price point at that time. It was quite high, mm-hmm. so you started looking, okay, checking the boxes of what I couldn't do. Oh, we can play the twins. Oh, we can use our house. Oh, we can use John Grice as a, an actor. We can use Garrett Morris. We can use Patrick Bouchot's people that were around us at the time. Sure. So it was a very resourceful. Uh, first time movie and very unique at the time because no one had had told that subject matter mm-hmm. yet correctly. I think there was sisters, but no one had really saw, saw the fusion of twins or the kind of intimacy that two uh, conjoined twins had. So it was it was it was, it was definitely eye catching. And uh, it allowed us to really make our mark, you know. And then, you know, I, I just I just love the pitch session about like how could you walk into a, a – well, first of all, did the money come from Lakeshore or did it come no, from – No, it did not. She eventually left the Lakeshore. And before she became a sales agent, packaging agent at William Morris, Rena was able to find uh, an equity source. And it just happened to kind of – it landed at, at – at, we were having trouble doing it because, like, on paper, like, <laughs> who didn't act? Siamese twins, a hooker. You just keep saying these things, and it's just like it's a no-fly thing, you know? This is a hor- – like I was going to say, this is a horrible yeah. pitch. Yeah, it's a horrible pitch, and there's just nothing you could – you know, that we, we took pictures to show. I mean, at that time, you got to remember, there wasn't the internet. There wasn't these photos. There wasn't any that you had the chaining bunker, and that was it. You know, <laughs> right. that was the image of Siamese twins. They coined the phrase – there was no kind of the medical term conjoined was just barely coming to fruition. No one really used that term. Mm-hmm. And so we had to kind of 
figure out, okay, what's the political correct way of saying this? This is, and start telling people, hey, it's about conjoined twins. And then they get a prostitute that didn't do well. <laughs> it was really, <laughs> and you lost me a prostitute. <laughs> yeah, you lost a lot of interest that way. But the financier uh, who eventually funded the film had 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 met Sammy twins. Had twin sisters, so mm-hmm. she saw the intimacy just between the sisters and thought this was a good representation of what she knew <laughs> about that relationship. And so she was very kind enough to finance the film and. We were very, very l- lucky uh, to to do it. I mean, at first when we, I remember we were taking it out first. We were going to all the normal places, the Merrimaxes, sure, the new line or fine lines. Remember, there was a lot of those little. Oh yeah, um, the mini majors. Yeah, yeah all the mini majors. Yeah, the mini majors that was, it. and uh, it was challenging because no one could see the fusion and no one could understand. I mean, it just looked like a big ticket item with the twins being fused. Mm-hmm. It was going to be expensive, regardless. You know, no one thought like, hey, how can you do this practical and make it look good mm-hmm. or believable. So that script inherently looked like five, ten million dollars. And so uh you know, we eventually stripped it back down to make sure that it could stay within the room, the four wall drama type thing, and then did a lot of testing within our own uh house of how we were going to be able to, you know, it was camera camera angles versus what you didn't see that could sell these twins. Walking was probably the hardest uh contraction you have to do but we only did it a few times you know and, and 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 you know your weaknesses really became your strengths in that idea because you could they were immobile and we couldn't move a lot of sets we couldn't do a lot of things so it really added to the claustrophobia of, of, of these two brothers that couldn't be apart from each other and that inherently was like the side effect of having a movie that was very closed set you know i think there was six sets altogether. Yeah. That yeah, it's, it's it's an insane story, and I always I always found it fascinating um, about how you guys got your start with that movie because it yeah. is again on paper a horrible pitch. Oh, uh, it was bad. and 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 also the the other thing is too that you actually from at least from this point of view, and you could tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong or not, but you actually it seemed like you guys had pretty much creative control over that project. Yeah, we did. We did up until I mean up until the cut. We had a cut that we submitted to the financier and the producers, not Reno. There was another one that was kind of between the money and mm-hmm. us. Um, they didn't quite um, under, they didn't quite digest the story as well as we thought they would. And they had a lot of questions and they had a, basically would have wanted to recut it in a, in a way that they thought was much more pleasing. Um, mm-hmm. And it was, a, it was a, it was a very, it was a very defining moment at the time. So we, we made a deal with them that was like, look, let's take it up the mountain. If it, if it sells for a price, you know, I think just even sells, we get our cut. If not, you guys can take it and recut it. So there was a lot of pressure on that initial, oh, wow. that, that, um, yeah. Cause we were riding on it. It was one of those things where, you know, you saw the twins, they just thought it was a little bit more, you know, slower than it should be and i was like look that's just inherently characters you're, you're not going to be able to jazz it up you know this is not stu- this is not stuck on you <laughs> yeah exactly it's, it's a very much it's a much more a uh a tone piece about a relationship and you get into it and understand it it's like um and so once it was really embraced by the sundance community and roger ebert came out and yeah. called it one of the best films of the year it pretty much quieted all that quickly because the reviews were really were the next day type reviews mm-hmm. so he he came out in the forefront immediately and was like this is probably one of the best films of the year then he followed up when it came out with that janet maslin came out with an amazing review this is this is when you your film really depended on a review i mean it was make or break each city depending yeah. on the head reviewer you would march into that town have a screening and if that head reviewer did not like your film you pretty much killed your box office because it, it was all of that and back then there, there were some really big name reviewers oh, yeah. you know in each in each publication so we were very fortunate to get right off the bat with, and get on uh, Roger's uh, good side he was such a champion throughout until he passed away so. I actually had the pleasure of uh, he gave me the re- a review of my very first short film Mm-hmm. And he was uh, the, one of the most gentle, wonderful yeah. Yeah. souls I'd ever met, and and he was a champion. He really was. was that, a, he was, was a champion. So, yeah, it, it, and he wasn't your your what you call a critic. Critic. He was so he he just wanted to believe in the good of everyone's work, and mm-hmm. he, I, I I rarely saw him go after something for the spite of going after. He always felt 
and I'd always read, well, well, what's good about this film or what's good about this story? And then focus on that and say, okay, maybe some things didn't come Mm -hmm. and uh, satisfy him uh, the way he thought it would, but he never focused on it. And he was such a, such a darling to Michael and I, and I, I miss him tremendously because I think he would have still championed a lot of these things that we're doing. Yeah, without question. And he was, uh, he he was, he was definitely a champion without question. And and he had, for people who don't know or wasn't raised in that time period with Roger, he was the dude. (laughs) Yeah, he was. Yeah, that was no, there was no one bigger than him at that time. There's no one, and there's no one who's ever, no critic that ever won the Pulitzer. No. Other than him. Yeah, exactly. And so when he, you know, when he, uh, I bless remember. you, blessed you. Yeah, when he blessed yeah, you. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, when he blessed you. It was it was I remember the phone call. He he'd seen the movie and he wanted to meet with us. And oh, I was like, God. Oh wow, this could either be really good or really bad. I'd watch him. I grew up. He was of course. on PBS. Yeah, when he was on PBS with yeah. Gene. You know? Gene is it, yeah, yeah, And course. Gene had passed away yeah. prior to prior to the screening. Mm-hmm. So we didn't get a Gene review. And uh, you know, I don't know if he would have liked it. I I'd assume he may have it would have been a great argument. They would have been nice twins, you know. What I mean, it would have been amazing just to see them fight over it, you know. You know? Um, yeah. Now, after after Twin Falls, Idaho, you got the juice to yeah. go make Norfolk. Norfolk. Uh, yeah, we made a small uh, digital film jackpot in between. Okay. With, with John Grice, um, that actually got a little bit more award and attention than Twin Falls. It it won the Cassavetes Award. It's a spirit. It was a, it was a much smaller movie, and it was actually the first digital movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, to be released it's on the timeline right before star wars which is really fascinating that we we actually (laughs) took that cine alta right before he did it oh you shot it with the cine alta yeah 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 we just saw an alta before that so you see a timeline (laughs) you see this little movie called jackpot right before star wars and it's like so it was it was that's brilliant we did that and then we um were able to um uh get enough attention uh and put together uh north fork that was up in montana location up in montana which was the beginning of those stories you hear of losing your money and all that kind of we we hadn't had, we hadn't had that experience yet and that was kind of that bigger we're moving forward we're losing money uh, type thing that happens to uh, independent filmmakers we well, see, you know? without question and I've actually studied Norfolk a lot. Uh, over the years, because I, I loved the movie when it came out, and then the, that wonderful documentary on the DVD, yeah. yeah, yes, that just told, just showed the hell, yeah, the, the insanity of yeah. what you guys were attempting to do. I mean, yes. building that yeah. that boat, <laughs> building the this building park out there, the, <laughs> the plains of Montana. I mean, as we always are saying, you know, once you step foot in Montana, you're part of the food chain. You just did. <laughs> There's nothing, you know, there's nothing that's going to hold you back, you know, from the nature of Mother Nature. No one's going to protect you. Of, Nothing's yeah, protect they, they didn't even make clothes that was warm enough for, for, for Montana. It was, and it was, a, it was the flip side. It's not, it's not the sexy side of Montana, which is Glacier Park yeah. and the west side and all that whole thing everyone's familiar with. It was the east side, which uh, is more prairie, and the backdrop is the beginning of the Rockies. And, and then, it was it – Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 no. But the thing is with Norfolk as well is that, you know, from what I saw, like, was it, and I, I might be mistaken, did, like, did your, their dad or your parents yeah, were helping? Yeah, no, my dad, my dad came up. A, a he was a production, production designer. designer. Because <laughs> we great. couldn't get anybody who knew the land as well as he did. All right. And he built, you know, we built a lot of the houses we lived in or contributed to the building. We built the house that he currently lives in in Montana. So we are familiar with this building uh qualities what he could do so we had these plans of this boat he's like sure and he just you know he's former dea he doesn't he's seen a lot of stuff so he was like oh let me see this i'll build this where do you want it kind of thing (laughs) and he knew that he could crack ground in a frozen ground he just knew the terrain very well right and so it, it was a very it was amazing to see him um take that position and take it um head on and be like oh and he built the house the church and he built a few things and so it was a very, it was a great moment for the Polish brothers and their father. That was such a beautiful film, though. I mean, yeah. honestly, Norfolk was just. If you, if people listening, if you have not seen Norfolk, you got to rent it or yeah. watch it. Yeah. It's, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a love letter to the dying America. It's a love letter to dying in, in itself and what, what we've lost in our values. So it's very prevalent now. Oh, know, v- very we, much so. Yeah. And can you tell people who, was, like, because the cast was insane. Yeah, the cast was. Um, 
we started off with uh, we first got Jimmy Woods, James Woods, who played uh, my father, Walter O'Brien, and and then we were able to wrangle in uh, Nick Nolte, Daryl Hannah, Anthony Edwards, Tony, who's a close friend of ours, and mm-hmm. I was we were doing uh, to get some of these people. Jimmy was just a fan, so I'd I'd known he liked our stuff, so I'd, I got to meet with him and got him aboard. But I'd known uh, I did. I was doing the Good Thief, the Neil Jordan film, mm-hmm. uh, in in Nice, and I was out having a drink. And Mike had to fly back to accept an award for Jackpot, mm-hmm. and that's how Nick got involved. Um, he he were drinking. Mike called me and he said, "Hey, look, we just won the award." And Nick was like, "What's going on?" I said, "Oh, we won an award." He goes, "What movie?" And I said, "Oh, we did this small karaoke country movie, Jackpot." And he goes. Am I in the next one? I'm like, you damn right you are. <laughs> you know, so he was like that kind. He was, you know, oh, we, I just love Nick so much. And so he was so game for it. It just happened. We just ran up against the Incredible Hulk. You know, he was shooting the Incredible Hulk at the time. So <laughs> right. it, I mean, but, it, we literally put a jet on, on American Express to get him up there from Ang Lee's set. Well, from what I heard was like it, what, what I saw in the documentary. I'm not sure if it was the documentary or the book, but – you guys literally didn't know if he was going to be there. No, we and we pushed to the final <laughs> two and a half days. I mean, it was it became it became this kind of slogan: "Is Nick showing up? Is Nick showing up?" Andy Coffin, who was our AD at the time, yeah, was t- just took bullets for us all the time. It was like rescheduling every night, thinking, "Hey, he's going to show up." And then it's me on the phone talking to the producers of The Incredible Hulk <laughs> and trying to get him released, you know. And they're like, "Well, we need him here. We need him there." And Nick really wanted to do it. And, you know, Nick throws himself. I don't know if you've seen that role uh, that he did in Incredible. Oh, of Hulk. course I did. He's very he, he, huge and big and he really spends himself. So he um, he was exhausted, set, <laughs> exhausted, just dead. You know, he comes off the plane in pajamas and <laughs> some, I think he had some kind of sitar wrapped around his, <laughs> his uh, neck and his assistant was uh, – I'd come close with the assistant and so – he he helped Matt Traumans was the guy. He he helped me a lot to 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 navigate Nick up there. But once Nick was there, it was fantastic. You know, it oh was no, a, yeah. it, was, it was a great set, and you, you just got to see. I mean, we had it's, Jimmy there the whole time, and they, they just and, and and Jimmy really wanted to work with Nick and never want, and never had an opportunity. So there was such this great bonding of, I mean, extreme right and left. You yes, know, in, in their views <laughs> very and much. So, imagine taking them to bowling. It was, oh the, my God. it was the, it was the kind of the, uh, the, the kind of debate about things that were for a lifetime. And also Peter Coyote was in it. So he was there as well. <sighs> so there was a lot of. And Daryl Hannah and Daryl Hannah too. Yeah. yeah. Was in it. I mean, it was, it was one of those casts that, I mean, and then when you're up there and you're in such a remote area, mm-hmm. you become, you become so close and everyone becomes a family. But, oh yeah. And Ben Foster was in it. That's so right. Was like, ben was yeah, in it too. Yeah. So it just kept going. It's just like we just started – we'd accumulate these casts prior to the films that we made before. And those would either hit the market or people would hear them. People would watch them and they're like, what are the Polish brothers doing next? I want to work with them. And so we were able to get this reputation of doing these films that people re- – these actors really wanted to be in. That, yeah, it's, it's a remarkable story. And it's also chronicled in – uh, the amazing book, The Declaration yes. of Independent Filmmaking, that you wrote yes. with your brother and yes. Jonathan someone. Shelton, who was a producer, was one of the producers on uh, the Astronaut Farmer and uh, Northwork. Yeah, it, it's an ama- if, and I've I've recommended it. it's one of my top ten recommended books oh, for you. for filmmaking. Yeah. It's a great book. It's it. Yeah. What I love about what you and Michael do in general yeah. and what you've done is that you guys are independent filmmakers yeah yeah you, i mean truly this is the kind of the thing that was always confusing to me because not confusing it was you i mean we're truly independent since the money was never from anywhere but outside <laughs> the industry whereas a lot of these indie films were cultivated and made at mini majors you sure. know and, and they had the support and the insurance and the help of corporations you know having smaller things we never had any of that so i mean mm-hmm. truly truly flying by the seat of our pants on these things you know mortgaging houses and cars and doing whatever we could and so that to me was always independent filmmaking like you would do whatever you took it doesn't look healthy <laughs> it looks really crazy <laughs> but that's what we did and so we we're always you know the style became your mistakes type of thing or the style became what you what you lacked in your filmmaking or sure. what you couldn't get you had to 
it was less about storytelling and more about story engineering. How was I going to tell this thing about an arc with no money, you know, or I wanted to tell the story about angels. How do you do this with no prosthetics or people like VFX? Or no, yeah, so, no, no high-end VFX or anything. Yeah. No, it, it's a magical film, and I do honestly think that if you had another $20 million, it wouldn't yeah. be the same movie. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. It would probably look like X-Men. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> the, the, the X Men had one of the angels in it that I think Ben Foster was. Ben Foster is it. angel. Yeah. Is literally yeah. angel yeah. in uh, one so of the. He was a low budget angel in our movie. <laughs> He's a high budget <laughs> one in Brian Singer's movie. But uh, but apparently that's why he got that other part. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know how Hollywood not, works. You know, yeah, like, oh, he played an angel before. Let's hire him to do an angel yeah. again. Yeah, exactly. In this in this day and age, yeah, he's rebranded. <laughs> We're going to rebrand that angel. <laughs> Now, I want to definitely talk to you about how you transitioned from being an indie film darling and, you know, Sundance and Ebert and all that to the studio system where you got a hefty budget for what kind of movie it is. And it's called The Astronaut Farmer with Billy Bob Thornton, uh, which I do love as well. I always, they, they, they're, they're such unique films. <laughs> they yeah, have they're, such they're, unique they're, uh, voices. Yeah. So, how was it transitioning from. Indie, indie, indie. To you've got a budget. What was the budget? The budget was like twenty million for that, right? I know it was it was fifteen, but I think Still. it was twelve hard, and then uh, the incentive of New Mexico made it rounded off at fifteen or something like that. Still, you know, you know 12. Yeah, yeah. So, oh yeah, a lot more than what we we ever had, <laughs> you know. And a lot I don't know about resources. you. I don't know about you, but I'd pick up twelve million. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was one of those things where you know, uh, we yeah, I remember walking online. Like, well, we got a lot of trucks on this one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot of a lot of toys to play with on this one. I mean, the, even the rocket build. When you oh. were able to do a lot of things that you weren't uh, able to do with the with the lack of resources. So, and you know, New Mexico was a very fun, magical place to to shoot that as well. I mean, the experience was actually. I had a great time. I didn't have. I didn't run up against anything. Uh, I remember, you know, specifically. This is a really funny story. I remember the, talk about transition. I we we were doing a bigger movie, a bigger science fiction movie there that w- they weren't going to kind of weren't getting their head dropped around. And Michael and I had just finished Astronaut Farm. We're like, we're going to go do this while you guys make your decision. Mm-hmm. Paula Weinstein and Lena Motto, uh, the producers, said, you know, wait, wait, wait before you go off and do another Andy. Let me read this. And then they read it and they're like, well, I think Jeff would do this. And so they gave it to Jeff. It wasn't part of our deal. And Jeff was like, I'll make this. This is, this is great. Um, I'll make it for a price. Um, and so we sat down uh, with him and uh, we were able to uh, get Billy Bob uh, immediately to it and sat with him. And he, he joined on. So he effectively made the show go really fast when he, when he agreed to it. Oh, of course. <laughs> but we were – right before we left to New Mexico, uh, Jeff Robinoff had called us up to his office and said, let's have a lunch. I want to, you know, pie, a pep talk. This is a studio system. I want to see, check you guys out. And he's like, look, just follow the script. Basically. <laughs> he's like, just the, 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 the headline was like, just follow what you wrote. Don't go off and do something crazy. Like he was fearing, like this was a joke. Like this, this script was not what we were going to do. It was a, to, get, to, to get by, you know, like we were going to pull a fast one on him. And so I was like, no, we're going to do it. So dumb me. The first thing we shoot is Billy Bob on the horse in White Sands, New Mexico. The opening of the movie is the first thing we shot. Uh-huh. And it's just bizarre as hell. You have this guy in a spacesuit <laughs> on a horse walking in White Sands. <laughs> first phone call I get is, is Jeff Robinoff screaming at me. Like, just live it. <laughs> and I was, I'll keep the, the profanity out. But you can imagine. It was laced with profanity saying, you're making this goddamn Fellini film, aren't you? <laughs> oh, my God. I believe this is what I, I let you guys do. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry, Jeff. That's not what it's like. It's a title sequence. We can cut it. You know. <laughs> so let's you know, as filmmakers, when you transition, your first dailies should be very, very welcoming and not be something esoteric as a guy in a 60s space uniform <laughs> on a horse in the White Sands. That was the wrong thing. So you learn real quickly you know, that uh, you want to send – you know. Things that they that they can they they're pal- palatable, palatable. Yeah, that they understand that. Oh, yeah, they're going to do that. And they're going to they're going to follow the script. Yeah. And and, yeah. and and for people listening, I mean, when you do get if you know if you're lucky enough to work within the studio system and have those toys to play with, there is politics that you have to play. Mm-hmm. There okay. are there is massive amounts of psychology. You learn so much. I mean, the thing that I think I learned the most was probably in the post and the editorial of 
because there was so many notes that was there that were coming down the way of you send a cut, it'd go up, they would all watch it, and then you'd get a you know a binder of notes from so many people, and you know the in, the Indian the indie guy in me is just like hell no, I'm not doing that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. and then what you're doing is cr- going to create this massive conflict early on rather than you know the editor at the time was James Haygood, a really great guy who taught me was like look just show them what they want. And then when they see it and they know it's not work, then they'll move off it. If you're going to be resistant up front, it's just going to be a bigger fight. And that's probably what I learned early on is just show them how bad that note is. And then they'll move off of it. You know, kind of embarrass them in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that's probably the biggest thing. But as the transition, look, more money, more time, there was not much to to worry about that. I mean, I think that the children were our kids, so that, that was a little bit... At first, was like, how how is this going to work? But the location, the, the DP, everything. It, it, there was there was it was like a family thing. It was very very um, small, but yet big. Nice. Yeah, and it was nice. It, it, it worked out very very well. I'm very happy with that. And the movie and the movie did well, didn't it? Yeah, it did. It did. It did really well. It really opened up a lot of doors to be like, oh, these Polish brothers just don't make these weird esoteric films. <laughs> they can do the strict story, you know. <laughs> And by the way, I mean, but, but, and that was released by Universal, was it? Uh, Warner. Warner, I'm sorry, Warner, Warner Brothers. Brothers. I know it was a big, it was one of the big guys. Um, yeah, it was. But, um, but for, a, for, for a studio film, Astronaut Farmer is still definitely out there. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's wild. And a lot of it came from, uh, the inspiration came from trying to get North Fork made mm-hmm. and then losing that, you know, losing the financing the night before. And, 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 <laughs> And there's just, so there's certain scenes in that that are really derived from our life that was very much about like, hey, you want to launch this dream or this rocket mm-hmm. and all the opposition and all the adversity you're going to go through and how you're going to overcome that and who believes in you and your family versus, you know, all those things were uh, were inherent in that story that we could tell this story from a point of view of living it, you know, living of like no one believes that I'm going to launch this thing or no one's going to believe that we're going to finish this thing. It, it coincided with uh, the way our father raised us and the things that he did and showed us the certain ways to live and build things and do things with your hands and, you know, do things your own way, do it yourself. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of homage to him as well. So. That's awesome. Man. That's awesome. So as we continue down memory lane for a second, um, <laughs> one of the films that really inspired me, I cannot tell you how inspirational this film is for lovers only. Oh yes, yes, yes. I it is the ultimate indie. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> the ultimate indie yeah. film. If I may yeah. if I may be so bold to tell the audience uh and I we've talked about it on the show before when we had your brother on. Yeah. Um mm-hmm. but for lovers only you literally sh- the 5D had just mm-hmm. come out. Yeah. And yeah. you uh your brother, I think a sound guy and and, and Stena the actress. Yeah. Um just went to Paris and shot a movie. Yes, we did. <laughs> That All was, of France, yeah, like uh, top to bottom. I mean, it was yeah, in, yeah. it's an insane yeah. story um, of how you made it, but I love the story because Michael said it in the first in the first um, interview. How, I'm like, how did you get Stena in involved? <laughs> and for people who don't know Stena Kadic, <laughs> who is uh, she was on a, a very long running hit show called mm-hmm. Castle. Mm-hmm. Um, she was still pretty, you know. She's still at the time. Yeah, I think it was the beginning of the second end of the second and yeah end of the second or end of the third I can't yeah remember. so she was a, she was already on her way and she had mm-hmm. done a bunch of other stuff prior to that yeah. you know she's yes. a wonderful actress but the the way I was told is that that you guys just put a a call out in your agency and just said hey look we're gonna go make a movie and we don't know <laughs> like we're yeah. going to Paris do, do you want to come yeah. is yeah, that basically it was like we'd shared the same agent mm-hmm. uh Stana and I I didn't I didn't know at the time that we, we'd shared I'd went to the agent at the time that was representing me. I said, look, these are, this is what, what we're going to do. This is the requirements. Um, do you know any actress that would be willing to do it? And it was like a little short list. And Stana was the first uh, girl uh, actress on board. So we met with three, I think. And she was the one that was just like, let's do this. She had, the, the, she, she was brave from the very, very beginning and you could just read it. I mean, when you do these movies, like even like a headlock and, and these, you're casting a lot side outside the lines as mm-hmm. well. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're looking at what, um, what those moments are going to be like when they're there, when you don't have a trailer and you don't have a room to go back to how, how, how people are going to respond to that. And so we knew it was going to be run and gun and 
tough. There was a lot of physicality involved in it, but we knew that, you know, your personality was and your character was definitely going to be tested and she was right up front. Um, besides just her ability, her ability to act it was amazing. Um, and you were the co-star and you were the yeah, co-star. Yeah, the co-star, yeah. And so it was, there was a lot of preparation for it in the sense that it, it, it probably looks a little bit more free handed than we were, but we, me and Stana would rehearse every night we make we take it upon ourselves to be as fully prepared because they were live sets or life situations. <laughs> when, right. So you don't you don't want to mess up in the sense that like, I don't know my lines, or you don't know your lines. So we'd rehearse them the night before, backwards, forwards, different ways. Understand what the characters were, the intimacy level, what we wanted to show, and then we would we would just hit the street. We would be able to do these things so natural, and that really helped us out. Yeah, and know? then of course whatever happened on the day, you kind of had to roll with it. Yeah, you had to roll with it. I mean, it was it was it, it was modular. The script was as modular as you could make it. It didn't ha- necessarily be like, well, you know, we had a, a, things that were in the bed were probably those are easy, but the thing that was on the boat or on the beach weren't necessarily written beach and boat. Those were things that we were able to attain on our on our journey. Or the motorbike was there, but not in knee. So it was it was very modular in the way that we had to be able to approach it, which is. Uh, challenging, but at the same time freeing, because you would get these amazing things like the boat, like the beach. How about the, the cl- how about the cliff? Oh, the cliff was tough because you don't have anybody scouting it. You have no one out there. You're you're actually looking at it the day you're going to shoot, <laughs> and then there's no one jumping before you. You know, <laughs> so there's you no really one. don't know what's underneath. Like <laughs> no, and so there was some there was some defining moments there where where you thought this is a little bit far or this, you know, judge trying to judge it from the top. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah. It was tough. It was, it was, I mean, to have her do it, it was amazing. And you I can mean, t- at that point you couldn't turn, she couldn't turn around. <laughs> no, no, of course not. But the funny yeah. thing is about like those, and that, the thing I love about that movie so much is the performances are so natural looking. Yeah. And, yeah. but what, but you guys are jumping off that cliff. You're jumping off that cliff. There's no yeah. acting involved. <laughs> no, you're hitting that water hard. <laughs> You know, yeah, it's and it's cold. It was cold at that point. And you look at the face. Like I still remember her face so clearly just right before she jumps. Yeah, she was she was nervous, but she was into it. You know, it was it. That's the thing about that particular movie was trying to capture that uh, that feeling of alive. You know, like it's hard to it's hard to articulate what you do, but you know. It's nice to be an actor in an environment that is feeding – you can feed off of it. It, it. it invigorates you. It does not like people coming up and touching you for your makeup or you're right. going action or cut. <laughs> Michael was rolling all the time. So there was moments that were just so pure that you can't really get because it's always like a starting gate. You know, It's always like action, boom, you're out of the gate. You know, Cut, boom, you're done. This was so fluid you know, mm-hmm. and you were able to – really harness the energy that was around us and the things that you would do and, you know, the, the natural things that couples do put, you know, groom each other, put things around each other, you know, like put the hair behind her ear, Mm -hmm. those type of things just became inherently natural because you're with somebody for so long doing these things. So, so we, we, that kind of subversive kind of stuff, we really benefited from it, you know? It was uh, yeah. It was it was my direct uh, one of my direct inspirations to make my first feature, uh, which was uh, very similar in that sense because I was just kind of like let's just kind of roll with it and see. And mine's was I didn't have a script. We had a, a scriptment, uh, uh-huh. but uh, but I had insane actors. Like I had really really um, seasoned you know oh, actors nice. who had been doing this for twenty years. I mean, you need you need to be. That's the thing when people watch it. I have met with a few people you know wanting to emulate. Lover's only said, Look, that's like our eighth movie. That's not like <laughs> right. the first, that wasn't our first one out of the gate. I don't know if we could have done that. I mean, we knew what not to do more than what to do, and that's probably more important. Um, right. right. In, in that particular film, uh, we, we knew what was in the parameters of what the story what you could do, you know, and that is something, and that is something I think that people listening is like if they go see Lovers Only and they go, or or if they see Puffy Chair, yeah, uh, yeah. Or, or or something like that. Like a lot of times, you you know, when you made for Lovers Only, that was your eighth film, yeah. you know, and when I made my movie, I'd been 
directing for 20 years yeah. uh, at that point. So there's like, you know, and in post production, and I kind of knew what I can get away with. Uh, yeah. You mm-hmm. kind of can't jump into those films at, for, at, you know, up front. <laughs> no, because I think you're concerned when the first time filmmakers, you're concerned with much more things out, outside the lines than you are inside, you know, yes. where, what's happening. And it's, you know, it's the game is fast at that point. It slows down at each film you do. And so it was much slower to be able to know like, okay, we just need this shot. We need this mm-hmm. shot. I'll be married. A lot of storytelling is made in editorial. And so when you go through numerous films, you start to understand where the fat is and what you can cut and what you don't need and what tells a story um, much faster or, or how linear, th- just how storytelling can be reduced through editorial and the way the language works. And it's, I don't think if you're a first time filmmaker, you get to see those different uh, methods or different ways of telling a story, you know? And then another thing that was kind of revolutionary with For Lovers Only is that you guys made a good amount of money off of it. Yeah, we did well. <laughs> you we did, 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 we well. did well. And I don't want to be crass about talking the numbers, but yeah. on a distribution standpand, you used iTunes yeah, before we the, it was a the, thing. Yeah, before any of this kind of uh, internet or these kind of what they call distri- distribution, there was not a lot of platforms and deals out there. Mm-hmm. I remember when it got released the next day, SAG called me and we're like, you don't have a deal. And I said, well, there wasn't one existing for a digital platform. Right. And so that we had to go in and create this, this uh, digital, uh, what they call new media uh, idea. And so we consulted on that. But yeah, there wasn't a lot about that. And we just felt, I mean, I think it's documented. We just felt that the intimacy level of the movie warranted that, you, you know, you can watch it on your phone or you can watch it on your iPad. It was much stronger uh, and effective in that medium than it would have been uh, projected. We'd, we'd projected it a few times in, in uh, Europe in a couple of film festival, and it was great. We won an audience award and, thing, and things, people really responded to it. But we felt overall, if people could discover it mm-hmm. on their own, th- the power was in that. It was more about a kind of a keyhole romance where you're kind of looking in on people rather than, you know, hey, we're going to show you this love story because it's very intimate. It's very, very intimate. Oh, it's, 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 there's an energy that comes off the screen for that yeah. film. It yeah. is, yeah. it is beautiful. It is, it is a wonderful film and, yeah. and, and it's in black D- and white. Yeah, yeah. Black and white 5D really allowed us to get really close within centimeters of the actors and it, 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 it just, everything worked at that moment in time. You know, the, the, the equipment, the way we were able to move, uh, Location. Not very many, yeah, I didn't, not, not very many people were on the street shooting this, you know, shooting this way. So it didn't look like we were shooting a movie. And so <laughs> yeah. we didn't get, we didn't get, uh, disrupted at all. We didn't get bothered at all on that shoot whatsoever. So, well, because, because, be, you, who, what kind of crazy people shoot a movie with a 5D? I mean, seriously. Yeah, at that point, there was nobody and, <laughs> and, 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 and nobody had come before. I think there was a few people that were, Using it as supplemental things, you mm-hmm. know, supplemental ways of in between shots and some TV shows, I think we're using it when they had to get into tight spaces, but it was never meant for that. I mean, it was like a little digital card. I think they put in there for wedding photography mm-hmm. to shoot video at the time, you know, and we're like, well, we'll exploit that, you know, <laughs> so we'll, make a, we'll make a big movie with that. And so or try to, and so it, it worked. I didn't, we didn't have very many problems with it. You know, uh, it shoot, you know, the, the, when you brought it back and, it wasn't truly black and white. It was very sepia. There was a lot of yellow because mm-hmm. it was a color card, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so you find out quickly that black and white is, you, we had to really, uh, modify it, black and white. Yeah. We definitely had to work with it. Yeah. And- we had to work with it. And we were lucky enough to have like Warner brothers, our contacts be able to zip it in there and, and <laughs> tweak it to, and suck all that. I mean, there was a tremendous amount of yellow in, in that camera. No, oh, um, oh yeah, back. I mean, it was like first generation five D. Yeah, yeah. But you just don't, you think your eye sees black and white, but it's actually warming it up with the yellows. So. That was insane. Yeah. And and you did create a, an amazing uh, documentary on the making of that film, yeah. which I did. I mean, there was so many questions, and it got a lot of you know hype, uh, a lot of internet, and a lot of film schools. A lot of people talk about it, and. I just felt it would have been – it's so much easier just to say, hey, this is how we did it. <laughs> yeah. Digest it when you do it. It's only 22 minutes mm-hmm. um, and enjoy enjoy how we did it. Um, and it, I, I I saw it the other day and I was like, wow, we're, we're crazy. No, you know, no, like no. I, I know the feeling. <laughs> you yeah. look at it like, wow. did we do that? You're, you're so focused on getting the film done and are doing it that way that you're not really – 
seeing all the red flags of what could have went wrong. No, I, no, absolutely. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can get uh, both the, the documentary and For Lovers Only on IFHTV. We are working on it with the distributors uh, as we speak, but I really do hope because I want to share well, I that. know the filmmakers. You let me know. Okay. <laughs> I will. I'll, 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 I'll call you for sure. Um, now let's talk about your latest film, Headlock, mm-hmm. or as it's known on the street against the club. <laughs> I'm, so I'm, so, so, I'm so happy I have a sense of humor about this. No, no. Uh, exactly. Because it's so – just when someone defaces your work, you're just like, holy crap. You I know. know so I want to talk – before we get into the movie, yeah. the movie has been – it's now called Against the Clock because of, uh, I guess, distribution decided to change the name. Yes. I, can you tell me there was a funny story or a yeah, sad I mean, story? It's, it's, Please it's tell really, me. It's, it's really, really ridiculously silly. Mm-hmm. Um, there is no clock in the movie and there is no <laughs> guess the clock in the movie. Um, so that being said, you know, this – these – distributor um you know discovered the magic of the alphabet basically and was like oh hey, look. no it's not the alphabet thing again yeah oh. so it's like, do it a it's on the top of a queue on anything and oh. most likely people they have their research that say <laughs> their films do better with a and i was just like <laughs> it was such a non conversation you know like i was like you're, you're kidding me like i couldn't believe this was the conversation i was having i, I didn't have usually when 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 I would sell a film or whatever, we'd have a, a meeting, we'd sit down, <gasps> talk about the, how we got to this film, what we could do, what was our resources, what were our strengths, how we could um, market it. I basically got a phone call saying, we bought your film, this is the new name, da 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 hung up and that was it. And I haven't had any communications with them since. I mean, it just tells you the faith that they had in it, which was zero. And it was mm-hmm. like, we're going to monetize it is, uh, we're going to try to get the money as much as we can because we don't think the film's worth anything. And so that's where that came from. Um, and unfortunately, that's not the response it's gotten from a lot of people. I mean, look, it's not, it's a, it's a challenging narrative. Mm-hmm. But that said, the deceptive marketing behind it and what they're doing is, you know, the, the backlash is, is hopefully it's not as bad as I think it may be. Yeah, it's it's I've I've actually had that conversation as well with distributors when I was working with them on on the post side where they're like it was it was called, you know, the letter was you know, beginning started with an S so they just changed yeah. it to an AS. Like yeah. so did yeah. you like, and I was like I can't believe that's a thing. But I mean, it would have been great to have a conversation about, you know, alternatives or whatever. With A's. Um, but <laughs> yeah, but A's or whatever, or even numbers or whatever, but that wasn't it, it that wasn't uh even to be had even a headlock, even a headlock. Yeah, I mean, anything. It, it, but first of all, we had numerous offers on the table from different distributors. If you're going to go to someone who's just going to deface it and butcher it and do whatever they're going to do it, I mean, there's other there was other alternatives to be had. And so, I'm not quite sure why the financer uh, chose that. I when you're so focused on making a film, finishing mm-hmm. this film, which was just a tremendous hard thing, to oh. challenging. Oh. I mean, we made it for a, a million and two. And so it was so hard to do that I didn't protect myself properly in the sense that I thought, look, I'll finish the film. I'll hold my end up at the, of, the, of the bargain. I'll, I'll, I'm going to present you with you know, a, a, such an upscale kind of like larger movie than you guys have ever had, not knowing that this is what they would do. So it, it's just – it's really unfortunate because we didn't, we didn't anticipate this was the finish line, not the, the creatives, not the actors, mm-hmm. not anybody involved who put a lot of hard work into it. We just didn't anticipate this would be the ending. And it, what it did is just fractured everybody. It, br- it just fractured the support from the cast because that's not the movie they made and that's not the movie that w- anybody wanted to promote. It's not exactly what that is. I mean the, the, the one sheet is misrepresentation. It's got the most – it has me holding a gun. I don't hold a gun. You know, it's like <laughs> – I mean, they do, they're doing everything like it's the mid '90s. I mean, this is when this. And, right. and I don't mean to go off on a like a thing. No, do it, do it. Thing, but, but it's like this country has changed so much. Japan, Germany, they're not changing our name. This headlock. But in the United States, it's it's so different now. You know, the, when the bottom line is the buck, they don't even they just don't care. And that's what's hard as an artist trying to do work in the United States. Now it's like, you're dealing with, with these kind of billionaire bullies that they don't even care. There wasn't even a conversation, which that's the, the harder part of it all. You know? That's yeah. It's, it's unfortunate. It really is. And, and when you, and you were saying something like it's the mid nineties for people to understand 
in the mid nineties, you know, DVDs and, and video stores were still a thing and they would just slap any cover yeah. on. And I mean, look, we all, we all rented movies in the eighties that had a cover that had nothing to do with yeah. the movie. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, it's a, it's the puppy mill mentality, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, they don't really care about what they're doing. They just want to make money. And that's unfortunate when they do it to these, some of these movies like mine and possibly just get, get caught in the wash. Because there's a lot of these movies that they can do this to that don't have hope. But surely Headlock is not one of those movies, not my pedigree, not where I'm from. The cast. I've never made, yeah, I've never made that kind of movie. And so to try to fit it in and, and put a bow on it and wrap it up to be that to a crowd that is going to be very disappointed once they click it mm-hmm. and to see what they have. It's not what they – cut that's unfortunate you shouldn't do that to consumers or the audience that's just unfair and that's yeah. why uh, <clears throat> like uh, there was a there was a film recently that i saw called i think it was called this is this is life uh-huh. uh and the trailer looked wonderful and yeah. it has an amazing cast it has olivia wilde in it and uh, isaac um uh, i forgot his name from um oscar oscar yeah oscar isaac yeah, yeah. and it and it, you know amazing cast and the, the the trailer made it look like it was this kind of like really you know emotional uplifting you know uh, from the writer of Crazy Sexy Love or uh, you know Crazy Love whatever that movie was it was so good with with um, uh, Steve Carell and my wife and I were like all right let's watch it and we start watching it and it was the most depressing <laughs> thing I mean yeah. literally and I don't want to ruin it I should yeah. ruin it for people but there's something that happens like 20 minutes in and you're like you can't come back from that. Like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, you compl- like, I have not seen a movie in years that lied so Yeah, I mean, it's just unfortunate that, that they're so short-sighted to the audience, and that's how they cater to it. You know, they cater to the lowest common denominator. Yes. I mean, anybody who's just going to scroll through VOD and pick a, a movie by the, this letter is definitely not the crowd for this movie, <laughs> you know? And then, then I start, start to think, like, okay, we have A here. I mean, did they ever think about Aquaman, like, smashing us? You know, because that's going to come about, that's going to come before us. And I think, I think more people are going to hit Aquaman and then maybe Avengers after that. So I don't know if the A game that they're playing is they're even going to work. For but, this. The, so, but the funny thing is that people who are watching Aquaman and Avengers are generally not going to be into headlock. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so it's like this deception they're playing is. It's old school mentality. It's all it is. It's old. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's traditional it's, old school distribution mentality that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense no it doesn't it doesn't so you know i you know i have this sneaky suspicion that the way that it's going to play out and the way people are going to people are going to find it people are going to appreciate it will appreciate it and you got to just find your grace in that because it's a, it's a it's a horrible way to treat there's only a, a headlock every couple of years there's not going to be it was such a <laughs> unique way of making it and such a new, new way of doing it that it should be celebrated and be a trailblazer for other filmmakers not uh, butchered and put in a package to sell, you know, rather than be like, you know, we can do something different. It does have legs. We do celebrate this stuff. Um, and, you know, does it have a narrative in there like that they cut the trailer? Sure, they carved a narrative out of it, but it's just certainly not that. You know? So, how did you come up with the idea for the film and tell the pe- tell everybody what the film is is really about? So the. Uh, it's funny. It's about a clock. It's about a clock. It's about a clock that you have to yeah. be against that clock. It's a transformer clock. <laughs> yeah. Is there a trans? I thought I saw a transformer in it. <laughs> yeah. 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 They, they probably would stick one in if it would sell tickets. Um, you know, basically, you know, the short end of it all, it's about intelligence trafficking in mm-hmm. the future okay. and about these two uh, intelligence traffickers, one played by the lovely Diana Agron and one played by me. And, uh, and how when you start messing with the kind of brain, uh, things start to go awry in the sense that the brain – when I was, was fascinating to me what the kind of the seed of the idea was. The brain is, was, is such an amazing supercomputer mm-hmm. that it does much more than anything we could ever uh, kind of manufacture. And what was fascinating to me was like once you put something in your brain, it, it's your choice to bring it out. It's, it's such the safest of safes. You know, it was, it was like there's nothing that you can lock that's more safer than the brain. You know, you put things – you don't even know where things go that they're that, – you know, like <laughs> scent goes one way, fragrance goes – you know, sight goes one way. So you actually split up the intelligence as well. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, wow, this would be a great kind of idea for a, uh, a 
uh, a science fiction movie about you know someone going over getting intelligence using their their hard drive an organic way and then bringing it back and then extracting it and then at that point well what if that became viral what if something were able to infect it and that's kind of the seed of it all that was kind of the 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 premise that i had for a long time but there was always a section of this travel section that was always much much larger canvas of the travel side of kelly and until i did um uh, for lovers only did i realize ah i unlocked that i know how i can do this side of the story that wouldn't cost us a lot of money mm-hmm. if anything i think it was a little under 100 grand all those tra- we did two and a half global trips we did almost 20 countries that's um, insane yeah and so there was only four of us so that one side of it there's 17 days shooting with diana and andy and justin and james frain on this side and then after that it was pretty much abandoned at that point. It was four of us going all over the world, a cinematographer, a drone operator, me, and a producer that did the, the operated sound as well. And we did, we just globe trotted to all these countries, uh, eight and then 15 and stuff like that. And we were able to accumulate very much of a flubber's only style of run mm-hmm. and gun. To, I, to yep. get, you know, the motto was like, this, this side of the film lives in pieces because we knew we could plug it into a solid side. So we knew that, uh, Diana side was more of a spine that uh, whatever troubles we would, couldn't or could get on our foreign uh, side, we could plug into her side of the story because of the way we set it up. So it's basically, you know, uh, a, her side was the launching pad for this kind of uh, another narrative. So basically, I mean, to put it in kind of like a, a term, it was like she's the heart, he's the head, and you're going to put them back and they're going to fight all the way through the head of the story and the heart of the story. And kind of like weave it all the way through. So that's kind of the conceptual aspect of it. And then also in the the editing of the film is yeah. such is so unique um, and rapid fire. Yeah, it, <laughs> I, I can imagine. I mean, it, it is such a unique style of of yeah. shooting and editing. Yeah. And I can now that you say that because I wanted to kind of get like the fighting. Yeah. The editing oh, seems yeah. angry. Yeah. Oh, it was. It got some. <laughs> what, the, 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 I mean, it's. it's there's multiple issues of what, what was happening because there was no film to turn to that was doing that environmental editing. Mm-hmm. There was things that, that, that were samples out there, like, but they would shoot it the same way. They would shoot the same subject and just switch the ba- background, but the subject would be the same. No one was doing the angles and changing. And so when we are going to these places, you weren't going to be able to cover the scenes normally. You weren't going to be able to say, hey, I'm going to get a, a close up, a two shot, a three shot, and then move on you were just going into these things run and gun and being like hey we had the the typical run roll and fall type thing and we'd capture some of it in hong kong and then some of it in marrakesh and so we were just getting pieces of all of that in the train and bringing that all back you just had a bunch of pieces you know you had a bunch of you had some things that strung together really well and you had some things that didn't that didn't quite add up and it wasn't because we didn't shoot it right it was just it's your eye versus what it can receive at the time. It's funny how editorial, like if you cut from, let's say, sand as, a, as the texture to cement, it was a different kind of cutting and where you would cut it versus cement to cement or the environment of like Times Square we are in versus a, a sand dune. Your eye and the level of how you would receive that information was really important to the cut. And that's mm-hmm. something you didn't anticipate because a lot of that stuff is green screen and we did mm-hmm. everything in camera. And so there was a lot of trial by fire and a lot of learning this. And at the point, you just couldn't get editors to do the work log of it all because it was thousands of hours of like hands falling, feet falling, rolling that. Rolling left, rolling right, running right, rolling left, jumping, all these things. Mm-hmm. So I had to take it upon myself just to start logging all this stuff. And then ultimately I just started editing it because it took me to be like, okay, this right uh, roll works with this left roll. This drone shot works with this in Venice. This works with Hong Kong. It's insane. And then, yeah. And then, so, and then, but that formula wouldn't carry over to the next segment of Kelly's story mm-hmm. because it was something else. And then, so each, so I think there's 20, 25 segments of his story. Each has a different type of way that we had to battle to make sure that, to make that work. Yeah, it was, it was challenging. I mean, there was many 
nights of like in the basement in my boxers with my boxer, you know, <laughs> just going, holy crap, this isn't working, you know, and and then the financial aspect of it was on top of it, you know, so there was a lot of just problems like financial problems that came on top of trying to just figure it out as well. So I mean, it, it, had its, it had its adversities that, you know, I, I'm still having trauma over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the, the funny thing is, is that even after all the years and all the films that you've made, <laughs> is that you, you're willing to still take risks. Yeah. And I think yeah. so many filmmakers, once they get to a certain level, like they do a studio movie and they do, like, you know, you did Astronauts Farmer, but then certainly thereafter you, you went out and, and, and did For Lovers Only well, with your brother. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's exciting to me is to try to tell narratives uh, in a new way or, or push the envelope here and there. Because I always thought like, look, even if you if you crash, it's still beautiful. It's like at 100 miles an hour, everything still looks hot, you know? Like, <laughs> you know, like that's a, like, you learn a lot from Evil that's Knievel. That's a great that line. That's a great you know? line. You know, because even when Evil Knievel crashed, people watched. It didn't matter. Do you know what I mean? Right. It was the thrill of victory, you know, kind of thing. And so – I always was like, people were like, are you really going to be able to pull off these 20 countries? And I was like, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just something I'm going to try to do and we're going to come back and we're going to try to piece this thing together. And if it doesn't work, you know, at least we know we tried to do something new and, and, and innovative. And it's exciting to try to always bring something. Uh, you know, you can go to the – every weekend you can go and see the same stuff over and over. Why mm-hmm. not try to bring something new to the marketplace where it's like – and that's where you're going to probably find a lot of people who it doesn't resonate with because, you know, we're like, if you just go down to the psychology of it all, it's like the patterns the people are very happy with patterns, you know? Mm-hmm. And so when they, why Hollywood's doing so well is because people are familiar with the movies that are out there. They know what they're going to get for that 20 buck ticket. When you do a headlock, it's pushing blood to new parts of the brain. And it's like, Ooh, I don't know if I like this, you know? And so that's the risk aversion you're going to have. Eventually, you can make it, but are you gonna? People are gonna accept it, and that's that's the the problem of why they're repackaging and trying to sell it as something else because they know once that clickbait, it's basically clickbait now. Once you mm-hmm. hit it, you start to see that this thing's unraveling into a whole different thing. It's like I didn't want to microdose, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I didn't want to do this. Why are they doing this to me? Because it's 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 forcing you out of a story pattern, you know. And I don't know if that's as comfortable as people. I don't think people like to be uncomfortable when they're watching movies that much. You know? Not the mass, and, not the mass audience, but there is a specific audience for that. Yeah, and, yeah. and and but it, I, think, I think you have to advance storytelling that way. There's no other way to do it. You have to like go and push it a little bit farther each time. I mean, I figured out the kind of the equation. I think people like they're crazy in like thirty percent. I think I think headlines no, like is seventy. No, I, th- I think you're more about the ninety ninety two. Yeah. <laughs> 99, 99.9. So I gotta I gotta rescale my formula and realize okay I gotta well, do it. In, <laughs> smaller doses. Well, I mean, you look at a movie like Pulp Fiction when that came out, that definitely pushed narrative. It was a film. Yeah, I mean, look at 2001. Have you seen I mean, that well, lately? She, it holds, yeah, it still holds. It still yeah, holds. Yeah, it still holds up, but could you imagine watching it at 1960, what, 68? <laughs> that must have been so mind-blowing to try to figure out what the hell was going on when he went to the black hole. You and know, what was that whole, you know, the, the part when he's in the, the master bedroom? When no, 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 no. I mean, I mean, can I you still ma- think like, wow, that, that changed a generation with filmmaking. And you hope that you can do stories that rival that or kind of get into that framework or like, I don't understand it, but I respect it. You know, I don't get yes. it, but I respect it. And that's what we're fighting against because there isn't support for that risk taking when they do stuff like they did the headlock. People are going to be like, oh, I need to cater to the masses or I need to do it. And I said, we made it for such a small amount of money that I didn't think this – we are susceptible to this treatment and that's what is somewhat confusing because they've already gained from foreign sales. They've made their money back, but I do think they see the shiny allure to it and they're like, well, we can, we can have people swallow this hook, you know? You know, and, and, and going back to, uh, to Stanley's work, especially in 2001 from, uh, cause I, I'm a Stanley Kubrick. Everyone listening knows now I'm going to go on a Stanley Kubrick, uh, trip for right. a second. Um, but, that that movie when it came out it it didn't do well no it it, it it didn't do well but what made it money was the new generation the hippies mm-hmm. smoking the weed taking weed, the LSD yeah. 
and going to, can you imagine watching 2001 on LSD? I, I, I'm hoping to use that formula with headlock. It's going to come with a few little micro doses. Of, of, buy it from my website. Exactly. Taps, you know, some some shrooms with you. So but you it can, takes. But it takes. It takes really courageous filmmakers to go out on the edge like that and do something a little bit different. And and the thing that I always tell people is like, look, if you want to make art, that's fine. Do it for a price. And then and identify the audience that you think that this film is for because there is an audience for this. This is not a mainstream movie. There's oh, it's no. not, you know, you go to see Aquaman, you're not gonna enjoy Headlock. But no. there is definitely a large audience, well, well large enough to sustain to substantiate the budget that you had for it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I remember seeing movies all the way across the board, the, from the big ones from Jaws to Close Encounters. Mm-hmm. To all those, but the one that probably was definitive was Blue Velvet. Seeing that, <sighs> going, oh crap! This, <laughs> what the hell is this? You know, I was from a small town. I had re- roots in Montana. He's from uh, Missoula. Oh, so Lynch. seeing that really pivoted my idea of filmmaking. That's what you hope you do. You hope you you make a movie that you're like, okay, I have been corn fed these big budgets, but then I see a headlock or I see something like Flavors Only, and I'm like, boom, I can do that. You know, and that's how you're going to advance anything storytelling wise, you know, uh, art wise. You're going to have to have a few people who take those bullets, you know, no, and, um, like they say, the first one through the wall is always bloodiest. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and plus, I, I mean, I busted my nose on this film. I separated my shoulder. Oh, I got man. Concussions. I mean, the list is long of the sacrifices. And that's probably what the, the, the give I, I probably wouldn't give as much of what they're doing. Because mm-hmm. I've really never been married to the success of anything or what it's going to do box office. But emotionally, I'm more attached to this movie because of the sacrifices of what everybody did of Diana and Andy and everybody who believed in this type of filmmaking. And that's what's disappointing is right. is everybody buying into it and then this happening. That's that's You're just more emotional where this is such a business to them and that's unfortunate. Now, what can filmmakers do to maintain creative freedom what, you know, in this process? What, what's like one piece of advice that you could give? It's budget. You know? I mean, it's like you said before, it's, it's, if you're keeping your costs down, they're going to trust you. you, you know? and, and I think people can really sniff out if it's a creative decision or a lack of education. There's a big difference <laughs> between that. You know what I mean? Right. Whereas like, you see things in mistakes become your style type thing because you don't have the money to do it like the twins like i was mentioning before we didn't move them because we couldn't um mm-hmm. and it became kind of the style of the film i think you know with with anything with the strong voice people listen i've never been in a place where you know if you can articulate what you're trying to do uh that they're not listening t- to that it's when you bullshit and you're trying to talk a big game or you're trying to do that's when i think the silence go off and people are like i don't know you know i mean the, i don't know if there's very many good storyteller filmmakers around there's a there's a lot but i don't know if there's a lot so there's a lot i mean it was like the, remember in the 90s everyone wanted to be lawyers you know <laughs> and now not anymore to be a filmmaker of course you know? so there's going to be a lot of people who Love the idea of it, but not the battle of it. Oh yeah, it's, the it's rock and roll, the, the rock and roll yeah. director style. Yeah, thing. like yeah, I'm doing this. I got a camera in my hand, and I'm shooting like John Cassavetes. That's not that sexy. You know, it looks like it, but it's not. You know, it's I mean? ball busting work. It's, it's ball, it is. It's really hard because, like I said, it's not much more about storytelling. It's much more about engineering. Because mm-hmm. how am I going to pull this off? You know, the funny thing it's like you know the sequence when Kelly hits the car. And it starts to roll over and it's going head over heels. I'm thinking, how am I going to pull this off? Because there's no way I'm going to get a cage to pull this off. So I went to the fair and got on the hammerhead ride and just filmed me flipping up and down and then used and inserted it. And it looked just like a car flip. That's amazing. That's the kind of engineering you have to have for these movies. And it's less about, hey, I'm going to sit back in a a chair and eat a bagel and see this thing. It's more like, how am I going to figure out to – flip a car with absolutely zero money and okay. that's you know cost me the ticket of the of the fair out in Pomona so. <laughs> that's awesome it was fun it was, it was, it was, I mean it, they might think it's weird you know the guy in a suit in a gray suit that looked like that <laughs> with a <laughs> camera with a camera it was like it was and that time it was reduced I mean I think we had I mean there's a lot of supplemental iPhone stuff in there because at the time we just got into the 4k of it all and so we could use some of it and so there's some 
GoPro, iPhone 4K in there, and then the, some of the little, little tiny Sony point and shoot that shoots that we used as well. That's so, insane. Yeah. Um, and now, lastly, can you tell me the craziest thing that's ever happened to you on a film set? Not much on a film set, but filming. Okay. Um, we were arrested in Marrakesh filming Headlock. We were detained for a long time. Um, <laughs> and that was, that's a little, it was a little. Where were you? Thing. We were in Marrakesh in Morocco oh, um, on, a, on a motorbike. And, and uh, next thing you know, you're arrested, detained, put into a uh, uh, detention center stuff. And, you know, what was the movie Midnight Run? Well, not Midnight yeah. Run. Was it, was the one no, with, Midnight uh, uh, Express. Yeah, Midnight Express. It was like it could have been the beginning of Midnight Express or a good Dateline. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> Mark was, Polish was missing for <laughs> yeah, and it was at the time it was a little bit hostile, and nobody was really um, working with drones at that time. And we had like a six prop drone, so it was a little bit bigger than what they are now. Oh. And so we were filming some of that motorcycle sequences, and uh, and you didn't we have going, uh, you didn't have uh, permits. No, we didn't have a permit. None of those places had permits. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's just not my style. <laughs> no, I, I, I that neither, neither no, is mine, sir. That I just didn't, you know, you didn't know when you were going to hit the ground. You didn't know when you were going to film. You didn't know what you were going to use. And right, I was right. like, it's this movie lives in pieces. I'm not going to close down streets or get everybody excited that I'm going to shoot here for more than five minutes, you know? Right. Um, so we get arrested, we get detained, we get thrown in into uh, jail, and they're speaking this weird kind of pigeon French. I don't know what, it's a French, but it's, it's a, a very weird French. I don't know. Someone will correct me over Twitter, probably. <laughs> um, uh, and it was ner- it was a little bit scary, but you, you know, like with any filmmaking, especially with pit filmmaking, you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. So we sat there for a while, and I was like, okay, are we going. I mean, there was a moment I was like, holy crap! If that door cracks, I'm running. <laughs> you know, like because you're sitting there <laughs> for a moment, going one more level back, and we're not getting out. You know what I mean? Because we're in the room. It's a holding room. We go from one room desk to no room desk, you know, no desk in a room. So what's the next one look like? And so the, the processing our paperwork to arrest us for a whole mess of things that I don't know if we did or we didn't do. It happens. How, the how'd, you get, how'd you get the out? The door opens, right? And I'm about to bolt. I think I'm going to bolt. The door opens and it's the guy who rented me the motorbike coming to pick it up. Uh-huh. And he's like, what happened? And I said, well, we were riding in the village with the camera. And he's like, Give me a second. And so he calls his brother who's at another precinct and got us released. Oh, you know? so he had, he literally had a brother who was a cop. Yeah, and another, pre, yeah, and another precinct oh. down, down thing. And he came and was like, look, there's a mistake. They're filming or whatever. I mean, it was – it was there was moments there where you're like, oh, this is going to go bad, really bad, really <laughs> bad. You know? And um, and so like uh, my wife and even Diana, I think they were both aware of the journeys of, of – uh, what was going on at the time. So I'd be like, they were all worried. Like I went to off to war. So every time I'd be like, Oh, we were just arrested. And then they wouldn't hear from me. So (laughs) it was this really crazy, like, uh, um, uh, dispatch going on between people here in the mainland and what we were doing. Cause it was just, I mean, it was the ultimate run and gun from Hanoi to Iceland to all these places (laughs) that we had zero, not very little support in those places. I mean, we'd have a very, We'd have one or two people in Hanoi that would drive us around or in Hong Kong, but we didn't have very much support, you know, um, when, when we got there. That's yeah. an yeah. insane story. I mean, it's, it's for lovers, love, uh, lovers only on steroids, you know. It, it was, pretty much. It sounds like it. It was crazy. It's, and it's reflected in the film, for sure. So. Now, um, do you want to tell people where they can see the movie? <laughs> I don't even know where it's at. I mean, I know it's out tonight. It's out today. It's out tonight. as if we're as we're recording it. It's coming out yeah. today. Yeah, I think it's um, it's gonna. If you're looking for, you have to look in the yeah. A's. No, this is really funny. <laughs> there is being tweets that it's still under headlock in some in some areas. That it's not under that. That it's, it's not. That, yeah. So the timing. <laughs> there was a, there was a uh, fan who tweeted to me and said, "Look." I've been looking for against the clock. I can't find it, but look, I found headlock in the times. And I was like, ah, we won the forces with the, you know, um, but so, yeah, I don't know if she's on the East coast or not, but it, I mean, I don't know. There are probably some dark dingy theaters that they put it in. I don't, I'm not quite sure where, where so, it's at, but it's on, it's on VOD as well. I think it's the same day. Yeah. So we, yeah. So you'll be able to get it on iTunes and all that stuff. So either look up headlock or against the clock and I'll put links to both of them. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the, in the show go. notes for yeah. people to watch. And I'm going to add, Mike, uh, I mean, Mark, I'm going to ask you a couple questions that I ask all my guests. Um, what advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Um, focus on your story. Make that your star. Don't deviate from that. Like Ugh, that great advice. Important, important asset you will ever have. Your voice, what that voice says who you are is all on the page. I mean, you can dress it up with anything you want. You know, oh, I got this person attached or I got this thing attached or I'm talking to this. It doesn't matter. When that story is your star, when you're feeding that, it jumps off the page. I mean, it's the difference between Michael and I's career is having a story that no one had heard before, Mm -hmm. an insight no one had seen before, Siamese twins of things that we could talk about. Mm -hmm. And so that, that immediately separated us from us. We didn't need a name actor because the, the twins were... The star. Yeah, the story of this thing. And it's always been that way. I've always found when you focused on your story and that's your star, nothing else, more than likely you will generate enough uh, interest if they get that made. Would you agree that, and I tell this to everybody who asks me, they're like, what do I do? How do I make, you know, noise? I'm like, be yourself, be courageous enough to be yourself and do what you want as because that's the only thing that will make you stand out. Yeah, and that's and that's what's probably the most challenging of it all is because mm-hmm. there's no one to look at. You know, like it's scary. No, it's scary. It's scary at the end of it because there's no one like that out there. It's your own voice, and so right. you're like, I am I telling the right story? Am I doing the right things? It's it's very risky, but I I couldn't agree more that if you pay attention to your own voice, there's nothing like it. Even Michael and I are twins tell different stories, you know? And so, uh, it's so important, I think, to cultivate your own voice and understand how to communicate that. Sometimes you communicate it and people hear you and sometimes, um, they don't. So. Yeah. And if you look at any successful film director mm-hmm. or a screenwriter, every big one, they all yeah. have their own thing. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's the biggest, uh, or the largest collaborative art form we have, the most expensive as well. So yeah. you're going to have a lot of voices and a lot of different ideas coming in your way. So it's really important for you to know what you want and invite those ideas in, but understand you know, what works for you and what doesn't work for your stories as well. Now, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Oh, man. Oh, shit. <laughs> We're going to books. I this was a movie thing. <laughs> I just like divert to the Bible. Sure, I, mean, if, if you, I mean, we've had that answer before, but if you okay, like, <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. I mean, that's an amazing story. The, the, the it's part a- where they, get to, they get to the sacrifice is amazing. <laughs> uh, um, and then the whole, the whole Holy ghost thing, the ghost stories are amazing too. No, it's, so it's, it's got, a, it's got it all. It's, you know it I mean? really, it really is a, a fantastic work. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I mean, would they have 32 authors? It better be, you know, <laughs> at least, you know, um, that's like, there's a lot of there's a there's a, a lot of different books that I've read that I really like. I mean, I think one of the earlier ones was this, the Making Movies by Cindy oh, Powell. Cindy, uh, Cindy Lamet. Cindy Lamet. Yeah, that was, oh, a, that was pretty definitive. Um, that's a great book. That, yeah, it was one of those ones you picked up and it was real. You know, it was a real like. Yeah. I still, um, I still remember it clearly. Yeah, yeah, and it was one of the earlier ones that we he came out that I liked. You know, I've always liked. You know, I've always liked. Although my films don't reflect it, I've liked Story by Robert McKee. I always think that's a good to call back on to understand some of the fundamentals of storytelling. I mean, it's, there's such a formula to how films, stories, and screenplays work. So it's always good to go back and like, I'm gonna, how do I do this or how do I get from A to B to C? I mean, know the rules and then break them. Always, yeah. you know? So he's a good, he's good to set those rules up. I think that's a, those are two good the, books. Yeah. Those are two books. I really like. Now, what lesson took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh shit. Damn. <laughs> These are some deeps. I'm talking. I know. I know. I know. I didn't know that. I didn't know you're getting all like, you know, Oprah, Dr. Phil. Uh, uh, Oprah yeah. please, please. Oprah, yeah, not, okay. not Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil, <laughs> Dr. Phil making. Um, <laughs> Oh, let me see. What's the what's the thing? Uh, probably patience. I think mm-hmm. patience is a, is a thing because you like to you know you, you, you um you like to I, I I think patience is the hardest thing. Is it, is it whether it's patience or virtue type thing? That's always the hardest to to because you want to get up and run and make it, and you you know that you have to cultivate a story and it takes time and mm-hmm. everything that's worth the damn it takes time. So. I think patience is probably the, the, the thing. And, you know, not to be so serious, I think, to understand, like, 
be comfortable with, with what you're doing and not, you know, be so serious about it. I think you can take your work serious, but you don't have to take yourself so serious. You know, very good. Yeah. Patience is uh, one of the big ones. I get, yeah. I get that answer a lot because it's oh, true. Damn. It's true. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's my answer too. When people ask me that question, I go, it's patience. Took me forty years to learn patience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still learning that. You know? <laughs> yeah, I know it's, take, it, it's it's still hard sometimes, especially when you just want to get up and go. I'm like, I want this movie done already. Yeah, I uh, mean that's what I mean. This film took four years, so it was like one of those things where you're like, all right, what am I going to do today to make sure that we try to get this thing done and 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 understand the, the uh, that the pieces will will eventually come together of what we need. You know. Now, and three of your favorite films of all time. Uh. They they constantly change because they get sure. refreshed. I mean, Once Upon a Time in America is pretty oh. much up there all the time. Oh, that's amazing. I, I like that. Um, Dog Day Afternoon. Another uh, amazing up one. There. And let's throw one in, like Tootsie. Tootsie's pretty good. I love Tootsie. It, yeah, I just think it's <laughs> underrated as a as a comedy. I thought that was really good. I mean, there's there's so many oh, that of I, course. I love, are so influential of why I am, why and what I do and what I do, you know. I mean, look, Penny Marshall just passed away. I know. If, Le- 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 isn't Big like one of the most perfect movies ever written? Big, Big was amazing. Beautifully you know? performed, beautifully directed. And then also ar- ar- arguably one of the best baseball movies ever made was League of Their Own. Yeah, ex- yeah or the highest grossing, I think. I, uh, I think it might be. <laughs> I think I think it, is. I think it is. I mean, there's, there's that. There's so many movies that, you know, uh, that are so influential that I grew up in, in the 70s where – they were just feeding. Oh yeah, oh, Mad Max. Was, of course, was not the definitive movie that made my why I'm a movie maker. The one the Australian one with the before it was dubbed. It was on HBO, you mm-hmm. know, and they played it ten times because there wasn't times. a lot of stuff out there at yeah, that time. They were plugging in some day, day, dog day afternoon. I mean, did that not just blow you away that it was like he was doing it for a, a, a sex change for his lover, you know? Can you imagine? Operation. Can I mean, you even imagine like, that movie? Like, oh. the- I mean, I was seven years old or eight years old, going, "Wow, you know, <laughs> this, this is what we rob banks for." This know? is what it, you know. Can you imagine that movie coming? Like, there's a lot of movies that came out in the seventies. You like can't ta- could imagine Taxi Driver showing up today? Yeah, yeah, yeah they couldn't. It know? just, it we, just couldn't. Uh, no, they, it, it's, the time and space is just not there for that. Maybe one day, you know, we'll have the, those versions again. You know, yeah. You know? We'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll have to see. Well, yeah. I mean, it's all good. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I look, there's so many great filmmakers today that, that it's are just different. It's, it's just, it's just different stuff. Different yeah. Different environment. Now, where can people find you and in, in the work that you do? Well, I'm both, I'm obviously on Instagram under my name. Mm-hmm. I think that's a platform people use. I have my, oh, my own website, which is just markpolish.com mm-hmm. uh, that you can reach me. There's things to, to reach me there. And then, um, Twitter on both handles, you know, the, the headlock at headlock movie. And, um, they don't have my name. Some Russian has my name on Twitter. So, <laughs> uh, it, uh, his squadron of is my Twitter. Twitter I'll put handle. it up. I'll put it in the yeah. show notes, man. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's like the old CBs. Remember the old CB? Yeah. That was taken, <laughs> <laughs> you know, bandit. I wanted you know, but, Mark, uh, it has been an yeah. absolute pleasure talking to you, man. Thank you sure, so I much. It. I appreciate the support and reaching out and, um, and taking the time to, uh, talk about headlock and my other work. I really appreciate that. I told you this would not disappoint. I want to thank Mark again for taking the time out and jumping on to drop some major knowledge bombs on the tribe today. And if you guys have a chance, please check out his new film headlock. Uh, or against the clock, depending on where you are and how you look at it, uh, you'll see, you find it. But it is a very, very visually stunning and interesting uh, film, especially for what he did and how he did it. It's quite remarkable, actually. And, you know, as filmmakers, like we said in the interview, you just gotta, gotta take some risks sometimes. And, and, you know, sometimes, you know, the first one through the wall is always the bloodiest. And, and that's what uh, these guys do. You know, uh, that's what Mark and his brother do so so well so definitely check them out if you want to get links to uh mark's book any of the movies we're talking about please head over to indiefilmhustle.com forward slash 292 for the show notes and if you haven't done it already guys head over to shootingforthemob.com check out my new book about me almost making a 20 million dollar film with a mobster and uh and my journeys through hollyweird and who I met and all that kind of good stuff uh, while uh, I was trying to get it made. 
It's one hell of a story. And if you want to sign up for the book launch, head over to shootingforthemob.com. You'll get a free copy of the book and see the behind the scenes on how I launch uh, a book and do all the marketing and all that other kind of stuff, which can easily be translated into how to release a independent film. Thank you again for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 